today's show, we ask whether you can invest like Warren Buffett. We ask how millennials view retirement, what the budget meant for you, and we analyse what's been moving markets. Hello and welcome to Markets and Insights with me, Tom Stevenson and Micah Curry. Warren Buffett's name is synonymous with successful investing, but how easy is it to copy the Sage of Omaha? Micah went to speak to a couple of well-known fund managers to find out. Warren Buffett is the best investor of our time. Renowned for his investment skills and homespun wisdom, one of the best examples of Buffett worship is the excitement that surrounds the publication of the annual letter to shareholders of the company Berkshire Hathaway. Every year, the letter is trawled over by investors eager to emulate the success of the Sage of Omaha. But Buffett is more than just a regular guy with a knack for stock picking and coining clever sayings. He is also an astute businessman who has created wealth by building his own company. Is he a once-off? Or can other investors mimic his success? I went to go speak to two investors who have followed Buffett's mantra to find out. A self-confessed Buffett disciple, Nick Train of investment company Linzel Train follows Buffett's approach of buying companies he considers to be great businesses with good management for less than they are worth, and then holding them for the long term. Following what Buffett has done through his career and reading what he's been so generous to share with investors unquestionably has made us better investors. I think that what Buffett and Munger have done is demonstrated that by doing the right thing, I mean, they've obviously generated uh, tremendous wealth for their investors. So what do I mean by those, uh, those good behaviours? Only investing in things that you understand. The obverse of that, the flip side of that, is never investing in assets that are obviously speculative or low quality. Don't trade or don't trade too much. His ideal holding period for the perfect company would be forever. Terry Smith of Fundsmith has also taken a page out of Warren Buffett's book. He looks globally for quality businesses with advantages that are difficult to replicate. I started reading his annual report in the 1970s uh, and essentially I think if you read his annual report carefully uh, over time it's a pretty good guide to investing, probably the best ever written and uh, it's kind of remiss given this is the world's most successful investor if you don't study it. I think uh, an awful lot of people think of, uh, of investing in terms of share prices Whereas I think Buffett thinks about it in terms of the underlying quality and economics of the company because he's a businessman. It's better to buy a great company at a fair price than a fair company at a great price. That's, I think, his best quote. Um, now, the laws of economics and capitalism say that if a company's got those fantastic returns, they should be competed away. There are a very small group of companies in the world that have those great returns and yet they don't get competed away. And the reason that they are able to defend those returns is because they have this competitive advantage, the moat. Uh, what we're talking about is something they have that keeps the competition at bay. Usually brands, uh, controller distribution, know-how, those sort of things which are difficult to replicate. Nick is quite candid about copying the master and encourages other investors to do likewise. It's not as if he's ever tried to make what he does anything less than fully transparent. Why wouldn't you try and learn from that extraordinary successful track record? I particularly like the, the, the line about um, lethargy bordering on sloth is the cornerstone of our investment approach. In other words, this idea that doing nothing or doing very little and certainly doing whatever you do very slowly bestows a competitive advantage. And, you know, that runs so contrary to, I think, the, the, the mainstream view about the way you're likely to be successful in the business. I think it captures a huge kernel of what it is that's made Barcher Hathaway such a successful such a successful project. He's taught people an awful lot, if, if you're prepared to listen. Buffett's way of investing isn't the only way of investing and making money, but it is one that people can replicate. Um, it's, it's easier for a private investor to try and replicate the Buffett uh, investment strategy than it is for them to try and replicate some kind of derivative shorting strategy that some other uh, person running a hedge fund has maybe been successful with over time. 
I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer. You just find somebody who's done it better than you and <laughs> try and ride the coattails. Chances are you probably won't become the next Warren Buffett, but you can always become a better investor. And like the investors we spoke to, you become a better investor by learning from the greats. You can certainly learn a lot from the investment greats. Now joining me in the studio is Nick Peters from Fidelity Solutions to talk about how he and his team assess the investment process of fund managers like Nick Train and Terry Smith. Nick, thanks for coming in. Thank you. So tell me, how do you sort the wheat from the chaff? The first stage is to look at the returns of the portfolio um, over time and we look at consistency of returns. Then we look at the, the, the team that manages the fund and how stable their team is. And then lastly, it's the, 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 we look at the investment philosophy and process. And we look to see how consistently that has been applied throughout the life of the fund. And so a manager like, like Nick Train uh, is a good example, is he, of, of these characteristics? Ab absolutely. So uh, Nick set up his business in 2000. So the fund has got a, uh, a long-term track record. Turnover is extremely low. And he invests in uh, durable business models that generate a lot of cash. Thanks, Nick. In July this year, the Chancellor, George Osborne, delivered his summer budget, announcing a raft of measures that will affect our personal finances. Let's just have a quick look at the key figures. So quite a lot in the budget for the private investor to digest. What, what jumped out of the budget for you, Michael? Tom, what really stood out to me were the announcements around pensions. Now, the lifetime allowance, how much you can contribute into a pension each year is reducing. So is pension tax relief for top earners. But what makes this year a key year for pension planning is the fact that the tax year is being split into two. So instead of contributing 40000 into a pension, which is the maximum, this year, the 2015-2016 tax year, you can put in £80,000. So that makes this a key year for pension planning planning. Okay, so obviously that, that's of great interest to people coming up to retirement. But what about the younger generation? I wonder whether pensions really matter to them. Well, let's find out. Our next feature looks at how the millennial generation interacts with retirement. Born after 1980, millennials have grown up in an internet-enabled world. They have different expectations and values from those of us who grew up offline. They want different things and they behave in different ways. Studies show that millennials value immediacy, transparency, flexibility, simplicity and reliability. Compared to previous generations, they're more creative, adaptable, open to change, entrepreneurial and narcissistic. I think that retirement is a lifetime away. I know that I have a pension, but I can't really grasp what that will mean when I'm 60 or 65, or probably by the time we get there, 70. Um, so. I'm thinking about the next holiday that I want to go on and saving enough money for that. I have the sort of immediate idea and dream of seeing more of the world and I would love and dream to one day own a house but at the moment it seems in the far distant future and then I also am putting money aside because I would love to one day run my own business. Many of today's tech savvy millennials started their careers just as the global financial crisis kicked off and they're still trying to catch up after a period of poor job prospects and very little wage growth. Getting a foot on the property ladder is a challenge, and while this generation is better educated than any other previous generation, there's a price to pay in the form of mounting student debt. Retirement is probably the last thing on their minds, or is it? 
For me, retirement actually does feel quite real. And so the idea of sort of contributing to a piggy bank, which I can't touch until I reach retirement age, is a really comforting thing. We've talked about pensions before, and I think it was quite shocking how little we both knew about the pensions that we had and what our options were. I think what's really shocking as well is that you go through all your school life and actually at no point do you have financial lessons. It's having to sort of go out there, go onto websites and actually teach yourself or ask friends who work in it. Our research shows 26 to be the average age people start saving into a pension. However, saving into a pension is relatively low down their priority list. Getting a foot on the property ladder and paying off student debt are two far more pressing issues. I do have student debt, currently paying it off every month. Um, hugely demoralising when you see what you could have had and then what you now have because it's going, but you know, education is great. And I think that the main issue with buying a house for me would be saving enough money for the deposit um, sometime within the next five years, hopefully. That's possible. The dream? Yeah. It's not surprising that the young aren't too concerned about retirement. After all, it seems a long way off and they've many other concerns to deal with. The bad news is that as time goes by, it only gets more challenging to save. We've got friends who say, what's the point in having a pension? Because in 50 years, life is going to be some completely different to what it is now. So who knows if a pension would even be relevant. When you retire, you will actually still have, or hopefully still have, 20, 30 years of living to go and how you pay for that without a job, I just don't know. And then hopefully we'll all be able to be sort of running businesses from laptops and you know living, you can retire but still work. I think, I think actually the future to be able to sort of run a I don't a want business. to be running a business when I'm retired. <laughs> I want to be on a beach somewhere, <laughs> hopefully, on the other side of the world. Yes, it certainly doesn't get any easier to save as you grow older. No, I think in your 30s and 40s, if anything, your expenses just go up with uh, families and uh, owning a property. Absolutely. So in our next retirement video, we'll be looking at Generation X, specifically asking the question how the generation squeezed between caring for adult children and elderly parents cope. But before we get to that, let's talk about the markets. Tom, over to you. Yeah, so whatever happened to that summer lull? gone out of the window. Yeah, so there's been a lot going on this summer. China, commodities, markets have been up and down. But there's been a spillover and that's into the commodities market. Let's see what's been happening there. So falling commodity prices are a two-edged sword for commodity producers and countries which are dependent on high natural resources prices. It's been a difficult summer. But for consumers of commodities, lower for longer inflation and interest rates could be the silver lining. They're always winners and losers. But I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. If you enjoyed our videos and want to watch more, visit the Fidelity YouTube channel. Also keep an eye out for Markets and Insights Extra, where we'll feature the full interviews with Terry Smith and Nick Train. For more information on funds and retirement, visit the Fidelity Personal Investing website. So from Mike and me, goodbye and thank you for watching.